Oh, my God. So, you can see where this is good news because as you give your mind over to miracles, things just work out. Not based on your past learning, as Jerry was saying, and the prayer to open up, but based on trust in this divinity inside you that's guiding the way. And that's the fun part of it. Things just work out. You just feel so good for no earthly reason. You can't even come up with a good reason to feel this good. And this is good, too, because the ego had its own plan where, oh, feel good when you get the promotion, or feel good when, you know, you find your soulmate, or feel good when you get to that perfect job, or that perfect whatever it's kind of holding out, dangling its carrot, you know, saying, you'll be happy when, oh, there you go, you got that. And then you notice that your mind's not content. It's always, you know, the old Peggy Lee song. Oh, is that all oh, there is? Is that all there is? You know, you're always looking out to see what's the next thing, what's the next project, what's the next conquest, what's the next achievement. You know, the ego loves when the mind keeps searching and not finding. And the ego's in there saying, keep at it. You're just not very good at this. <laughs> you just try it. But the beautiful thing is you can learn vicariously from those that, you know, you don't have to go through the school of hard knocks in the physical realm. You can... I was talking about Marilyn Monroe the other night, you know, mm. fame, sex appeal, money, you know, status. Had the President of the United States uh, lusting after her, uh, and all these <laughs> things of the world would go, ooh, ooh, and yet, you know, very, uh, very depressed and very suicidal. It's like, that's just a good extreme example about how when you follow the ego's fool's goal, mm. bigger, mm. better, faster, more, uh, keep up the Joneses and then get as much as you can and grab for all that you can and go for the gusto, you go down those roads and then they're empty roads. I mean, you know, you get there and it's a dead end. And it's nice that we've had a lot of symbols that seemingly in history that we've been able to see that they really got what the ego said in plenty. I mean, they, you know, Marilyn Monroe was married to Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller. I mean, you know, even not only her, but famous husbands <laughs> on top of everything else still suicidal, still depressed. So that was that helped me in my journey. I was glad to read books and look at watch movies and meet people and really talk to them. Are you happy? Are you really happy? And a lot of them had, had seemed to attain things and really had done very well according to the world's or the ego's plan and they weren't happy. And I thought, well this is for me. This is a good a good lesson for me. I'm not, instead of trying to put all my energy into trying to achieve and accumulate and build all these things, I'm going in the other direction. The ego didn't like that. You know, mm -hmm. the ego's you fool and you're wasting your time and you're going to be like a, a bum, a bag lady. Mm -hmm. And initially those were some of the reflections I got. As I'm praying and meditating and doing all this inner work, you know, I'm calling forth witnesses, even initially my parents, uh, biological father, no good, lazy, dirty, rotten bum, get a job. Uh, uh, meditation doesn't really show up very well on your, uh, on your resume. I mean, like, hey, I've been med meditating eight hours. Uh, no good, lazy, you heard me. It's not showing up uh, in, the, in the debit credit column here. So, so it takes a lot of faith, you know, to keep up with your inner lessons and your prayers and your meditations. Because initially, it's not really the people, it's like they're just reflecting your own doubt thoughts about, am I doing the right mm -hmm. thing, or am I wasting my life, and am I going to end up in a gutter somewhere, <laughs> because I didn't put enough prudent care into these things, you know. So what I started to do was, I started to, to have miracles, and it started to show me that my inner quest was very worth it. And I was in college for 10 years, and I spent, I mean, I got good grades and did all the projects and got the degrees, but I actually spent more time in the philosophy, psychology, religion section of the library asking some deeper questions like, what's the point of all this in the first place? And tracing it in, like, why am I doing all these projects and, and all these committees and, and grades and everything like this? It came down to, I thought, well... I want love. And I said, okay, I want love. And so, so I want a relationship. 
Okay, so I wanted love, I wanted a relationship, and I thought, if I date women and they say, you know, what have you got to offer? Uh, do you have uh, some status, some prestige, you have some money in your bank account and everything? And I go, nothing. I have none of that. I said, it's not going to be very good. In fact, I, I was recently joking about it. I was doing a little skit with uh, David goes on the dating game. Uh, that was like bachelor number three. Bachelor number three, uh, what do you find uh, attractive in a woman? Uh, nothing. Uh, okay, bachelor number two. <laughs> bachelor number three, what skills and worldly skills and abilities do you have to offer? Uh, nothing. Uh, bachelor number two. But uh, finally, bachelor number three, just get off the stage. <laughs> Any more questions on you? Okay. What happens is you get into this divinity and you become intoxicated with the miracle and you just want to let it pour through you. But the need to crave to get things, you know, to accumulate things, to build and say, this is me, to carve out a niche in the world and say, this is my image, and it's a good image, and I'm going to polish it like a diamond and everything. You know, very important stuff if you're on a date. <laughs> uh, right, you know, how, how do you make a good first impression if, you know, you take a look at this stuff? So I had to really uh, go into this and start to say, oh, I guess... What I really want was, I want love and peace and freedom and happiness, but I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. I've been looking for freedom in all the wrong places and peace. You know, some of us think if we just lived in a particular place in the woods or we sailed the ocean blue, you know, that we'd, we'd have peace. But, you know, the ego is, is still down there until you get rid of or, or expose and, and expel the ego from your mind, then you're still not going to find it in form. So that's what I did, is it just, it helped me go inward and start to say that God was offering me that happiness and peace and love and intimacy. But my definitions of those things had to be questioned and let go. And that's what the Course does. I mean, that's what I had to do about sickness and health. I mean, I, in 10 years of college, you learn a lot of stuff about health. Uh, what to eat, what not to eat, you know, all about the body and exercise and cardiovascular fitness. And I went through stages of vegetarianism and on and on and on and then you get to this course and it's saying the same thing that Jesus said in the Bible 2,000 years ago it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles it's what proceeds forth from the heart and I thought my gosh that's what this course is about it's, it's like from the Beatitudes blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God it's about clearing the altar of your mind and letting the Holy Spirit with your little willingness uh, purify your thoughts. It's not about changing behaviors. It's not about morality. It's not about ethics. Those are systems of behavior. And the Course just says, what you do comes from what you think. And the only thing that you really can change is your mind. You know, you can change the way that you think, and your behavior will flow automatically. You'll, you'll smile more frequently. You'll, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll seem like you're joyful and happy wherever you go. You know, it will it will be a consistent state of, of this happiness. So, that's what I mean by getting into the subtleties. And, and like the question about sickness, um, you do start to realize that, that when you try to hold idols, that's what's being sick. That's, that's sickness. When you try to judge, when you try to have preferences, when you try to um, control, uh, that's sickness. And that sickness really, really isn't about the body. The body is just like a a reflection of your state of mind and so what medical the medical model focuses on is on the body and it's like symptom management or trying to uh, bring about the healing through drugs or through surgery or manipulating the body even alternative methods that seem to work with energy and chakras and so forth is still as long as you're working with the body as a cause you're missing the point that the mind is causative and that there is no sickness in the body. So that's really what we do and um, and it's wonderful the more you, you go deeper into it because you start to realize that that just like Jerry was saying, everything that you thought about this world, and I mean everything, was a mistake. <laughs> and it is humbling, but it is glorious when you drift into this state of humbleness and realize that you are clueless about mm -hmm. nutrition. 
You are clueless about exercise. You are clueless about diets and clueless about medicine and clueless about uh, fitness and all these different things. Your mind sinks into a, a, a state of trust and joy. And that is your health. That is your health. That state of joy, that state of love and glory. <laughs> you might say, blessed are the pure in heart, period. You can say that right there, because <laughs> you can put the period right there. You don't, you don't need to look for a reward. That's it. Uh, when you, little children are, are rewarded for being sick. They figure that out real quickly. <laughs> and if I have a tummy ache, my mom is going to just tell me about me. Mm -hmm. And so right away we're taught that pain is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Sickness is a, a, I'm going to get a reward for my mom. I remember my mom really hugging me a lot when I was home from school sick. And I think that reinforces something that later on in life, some people go through their whole life sick. And, and Getting attention? Sympathy. Yeah. Sympathy, sympathy attention. Yeah. You look that. So oh, as you were sympathy. saying that, I'm thinking, yeah, well, we were taught that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I, you know, I, I uh, listen, I, I agree uh, definitely, and I understand what you're saying. I was just wondering, uh, what would you, you know, I, what I've noticed is there are people, some, some people who are searching and say someone who wants to meditate and pray, and who's who's suffering, who's sick, who's sick in the body, and and want to find the answer, you know, want to do meditation or, or study the course or whatever uh, path they're on, uh, where the, they're in a situation where the body is interfering with their their prayer, uh, because it's hard to pray, it's hard to 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 sit and meditate when your body is in pain or is is ill, is sickness is. Yeah, because it distracts you yes. from what you want to do. What what uh, what's, what's, what would you suggest in that type of situation? Yeah, that, that's what's helpful about the Course is that it says there's a point where Jesus says um, sometimes a mixture of magic and miracle is necessary when the mind is too fearful. And that's what he's saying is he's saying that whatever, and magic is, is a broad term. We're not just talking about take the medicine um, or uh, go through the physical therapy or uh, move your posture, your position around if you feel discomfort or uh, if, you, if you're trying to meditate and you're so cold, uh, you know, it's okay to go throw, a, put a blanket <laughs> around yourself. Magic is a, is a broad word for the belief that you can change something in form to bring about uh, a sense of minimizing or lessening the, the discomfort. And so what the Course is saying is uh, magic is an evil. And in fact, when your mind is too afraid of the miracle and too afraid of that spiritual healing, then be gentle with yourself and do whatever feels helpful and comfortable. Uh, it's not trying to draw a line and saying, oh, that's a sin, that's evil if you take that aspirin or you go to that doctor. Um, basically, everything that you perceive is bringing witness to your mind. So even, let's say, if you go to a medical doctor, uh, that medical doctor can to the Holy Spirit is just another agent or another angel uh, that's being sent to help you. Not uh, an evil one that believes in <laughs> all this crazy stuff, yeah. but actually this is just an agent. So I've had a lot of people that, that have come to me that are in that place where they'll say, can you give me some practical things that I could do or help them get in touch with some practical things that are intermediate steps mm. that they feel comfortable doing. and the more that you practice then, once you get more into that comfortable state and it's not so much of a distraction, then you can get back into your, your workbook lessons, you feel much more inclined to attempt to, to meditate and to pray and everything, and you work, you do that inner work, and the more you get deeper into that inner work, then the need for magic slowly fades and falls away. So that's the way it works. Uh, the thought that's coming up is, uh, uh, Christian Science and Mary Baker, Baker Abbey, and well, not her. Supposedly, from what I've heard, Jesus also had a hand in writing that. Did you hear that, or am I? Yeah. Okay. So, so I'm inspired. Yes. Is that because that would uh, seem like uh, 
I guess some people need that. That's the only thing I can think that they they have. Uh, instead of taking the magic that can temporarily just heal them, with them it's black or white, either total faith or or you're dead. I guess uh, maybe you can explain that how how you can piece that together. And yeah, and there's been a lot of uh, stereotypes about Christian scientists and, mm -hmm. and children dying and without medication and so on and so forth. I think the best thing to say about Christian science, if you really follow it in the teaching, is basically pray first. <laughs> Put God first is, right. is the whole teaching of it. Yeah. And that's really what the Course in Miracles is saying as well. It's just that in the Course, Jesus is clearly saying that if, you, uh, if you're too fearful, Right. Uh, just like this gentleman's question, he was saying, you want to you want to reduce the fear. <laughs> you don't want to increase the fear. Right. And if you get to a point where you've got something in your mind where you're going, I should be able to uh, dispel this with the power of God, and the, and it doesn't seem to be working, and you start beating yourself up about it, mm -hmm. and then you start saying, I'm mm -hmm. a miserable sinner because, or I can't do this, and on and on and on, and the pain gets worse. That's not the direction you want to move in. You do want to reduce the fear. Mm -hmm. And and actually you could say that the same about miracles. Miracles, you know, should never be performed in the presence of fear. You know, that, that Jesus is saying in order to be a miracle worker, you know, even temporarily you need to line your mind with mine. And he says, let me do it through you. Mm -hmm. And miracles should be involuntarily. Involuntarily they shouldn't be consciously controlled that if you start going around trying to decide where you're going to bestow the miracles, mm -hmm. but that's not how it works either. Mm -hmm. You have to let the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. direct. And in many cases, smiling and not saying a word to somebody, or a pat on the back, or a hug, is the most, mm -hmm. the absolute most that can be offered in a given point. Any mm -hmm. words that would be offered would just be uh, mm -hmm. increasing the fear level. Mm -hmm. and. And that's why, as we, we all take on these professions of miracle workers, we're really getting into the subtleties of that workbook lesson, I will step back and let him lead the way. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot of, of subtle practice at this to really stay in a constant state of joy, because the deeper you get into it, you get into the state of mind where you realize that it was all for you, and that you don't have to fix anybody, you don't have to change anybody, the Course even says, seek not to change the world, mm -hmm. seek rather to change your mind about the world. <laughs> How glorious! Uh, people could be saying and doing whatever, and you're just sitting there beaming like, <laughs> the way to God. Uh, you get into such grace, you get into that state of grace, and, and it's so wonderful to not have to change somebody, to not have to convince somebody of something, to not have to even offer a belief system, but to just simply sit there in quiet certainty and feel all that love in your heart and it radiates out to the whole universe. Mm -hmm. So that's what I found that the subtleties are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And and I've, even with people that I work with, um, I have recently was doing uh, some gatherings with some friends and we had this joyful gathering and I get up to go in the restroom or do something and and come out and they there'd be this argument going on or this big <laughs> debate and then and somebody was really getting upset and everything and after they'd leave I'd talk to them and I'd say well this is good practice uh, you know if you find your brother getting furious uh, and you find they were saying no but I am not a body you know and you start, you start to get into this and then somebody raging and everything I said well you better turn it over to the Holy Spirit because for example in that case I, after the, the gentleman had left I said now I said the Course says that to, that to deny the body is the inappropriate use of denial. In other words, mm -hmm. if you are trying to deny something that is so deeply buried in belief, and mm -hmm. you're just on the surface trying to say, you know, I'm not a body, and right. uh, it's like two Course in Miracles students getting into a raging fight and debate, and finally one of them saying, I'm not here, and you're not here, and we're not having this conversation. What's going on? That's a good example of, of attempting to deny the body. You know, Obviously, there's some anger going on there, and, and that's not the appropriate use of denial. But what Jesus does say is, deny the belief that error can hurt you. 
Remember the power of your interpretation. You have a mind, and your mind is always interpreting, and you don't have to interpret ever that you are under attack. You don't have to ever interpret that anyone is under attack. In fact, that's a, a very a little logical thing that's in the, the workbook. I am not a body, and my mind cannot attack, so I cannot be sick. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying there is, if you start to really look at it, and you get deep enough into this, you will see the impossibility of attack. And that's mm -hmm. where your invulnerability comes in. Mm -hmm. If you're still perceiving attack, which just means you're holding on to attack thoughts, and perceiving through the ego's lens, it won't matter how strong you hold that smile on your face, no matter how you try to hold that body so it's not trembling and shaking, <laughs> no matter how you keep, try to keep from turning red, no matter how big of a front you seem to put on and try to control the body, if you're perceiving attack, you're not going to feel good. You're going to have some churning going on inside, some discomfort. Mm -hmm. And so this is a course in literally wiping away the belief in attack. And I would say that's what, I, what salvation or enlightenment is, is you come to a state of mind where you see that it is, attack is absolutely impossible. Mm -hmm. That you, you give up the dualism of attacker and attackee. I mean, to have attack, you've got to have two. You've got to have an attacker and an attackee. A victim, a victimizer, you know, a, a doer and one who's done to. You know, you've got to have that split in the world before you can even perceive an attack. And what the Course does is it says, keep coming inside here. Mm. You're going to see that the only attack thought that there really is is the belief that you can separate from God. Mm -hmm. And it's such a horrifying idea that this entire cosmos was made up to project that idea out and splinter it into tiny little scenarios over a millennium <coughs> to diffuse it, to try to make it not be such a horrifying thing. And that diffusing is not working. You find out more and more, you still got the rage. <laughs> you know, the, the Bible said forgive 70 times 7. The Course is saying, if you can forgive one person, if you could, if you could receive salvation from a table, Jesus says, if you could withdraw all of your ideas, all of your past learning from a table, mm. you could receive salvation or enlightenment from just a table. That would mean you'd have to forget what about length and width and height, about texture, mm. about color, about size, about shape. You know, you see, there's a lot there with that table. <laughs> you, you really are honest when you look at that table. You start to see. Mm, I think I know something about that table. And then Jesus comes along and says, "Don't tell the table what it is. <laughs> Let the table tell you who you are. Let that table be just a symbol that the Holy Spirit uses to tell you that you are the One. You are the Living Christ." You are eternal. You can never be destroyed because God created you. That's what a table has to tell you. Mm -hmm. That's quite a tale. It's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful uh, reminder that that table will tell you if you can remove all the judgments from the table. Huh? Just, just remove all the judgments. That's it. Gee, that's easy. That's it. It is. It really is. It's actually easier. It's easier not to judge than it is to judge. Made it hard by you know. By it's, it's actually easier to be enlightened than it is to to defend against it. Yeah. I had a friend one time who was down in Tennessee with me, and she's like going into this time of silence and whatever. And and she said, David, I don't know. I'm, I know you're going to be stocked up with with you know, food and everything, I'm going to go into my mind and face this ego. But she said, I've read a lot of spiritual books. And I've read about the saints and the mystics and John of the Cross and Dark Night of the Soul and everything. And she said, I, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, there's been a lot of people that came before me that uh, tried to go for enlightenment or salvation and they seem to get hurled back <laughs> from the cave or something. And I said, oh, it's much easier to be who you are than to try to resist uh, who God created you to be. It's a piece of cake. I mean, and, and that's the attitude you got to go at this when you're doing those workbook lessons. Not that you're going to do the lessons for 20 years, you know, to go at every lesson expecting to wake up. Uh, you know, when you're doing that lesson, whatever it is, that they're, oh, okay, here it goes. Full passion here. Full problem. Okay, Holy Spirit. I don't care what number this is. Uh, this will do just fine today. Whatever it is. 20... 
240, 360, doesn't matter. You know, I, that's the way I went to the, did the workbook lessons. You know, I expected to wake up every time. Mm -hmm. And almost like a child has that, that kind of glee and wonder, yeah. you know, where they, they don't, they aren't thinking, how long have I got to do this? <laughs> and how am I going to have time to do this? And, you know, all this and that. That's the ego. <laughs> yeah. Getting in. You have a question, Jerry? Or a comment? Yeah, well, uh, 